I tell you, I must tell you, that's something to sit in. And what I've seen on a little screen, and uh, the sound was abysmal. Uh, but that was really something. And when you can hear yourself rumble like that, you think, shit, it doesn't matter what you say. <laughs> you just sound like a mountain speaking. No. Nah. Well, that, I don't remember saying that at the Jolly Friar, but I'm glad I did, though. Because I got quite a rap after a, gr a grief walker about being um, uh, not fun. <laughs> but you can't do that kind of work, I promise you this, and not be absolutely slayed by how, what an insane operation we got going here. And, uh, and the laughter is sanity. It's not a break in the action, it's the rest of the action. Yeah. Yeah. Right then. Yeah. Well, maybe I want to speak to, I mean, maybe to be specific to the film, that there's a certain, there's a certain, maybe a little more behind the scenes. So, you know, we, we did want to introduce a bit of a surreal tone to this. And, uh, you know, early on, you saw the image of Steve walking in the forest to the mic. And to elaborate on the, in the invocation. And uh, Steve fought us a lot on that. <laughs> uh, that it didn't, you know, it, there's a very, I think, faithfulness to actually what this is. And, mm -hmm. and he didn't want to uh, create some kind of, I don't know, like a show of it, uh, you know, like a caricature, mm -hmm. maybe, of it. And I deeply appreciate that. And, um, and there is something about the, the, the film itself, which also lends itself, which is also different than the show. Um, which maybe just to say that the the reason why the film actually uh, ended up basically being everything that happens before they walk on stage, if you see that elliptical, uh, and that that kind of happened through the process of actually making. We shot many shows, actually three or four shows, but I realized during the process of making that there was something in trying to convey in that medium that didn't survive the transmission in that way. There was something alive that it couldn't survive and in that way. And so I realized that the best way to enthrone what was about to happen was actually to, uh, to elaborate on all of the, you know, the mystery that went into that moment, actually. And so maybe a, a question around the, yeah, the, the ritual of the, uh, the Knights of Grief and Mystery and how that is sort of the, maybe the re-remembering or the, you know, we spoke earlier about this idea that it's older than theater. Yeah. That this, what, what's being conjured, yeah. yeah. Well, partly it's a testimony to the way it happened. You gotta feel for the fitful, um, uh, completely unexpected, unintended, unsought elaboration that ensued from me meeting Gregory Hosmans, whose name I'd vaguely heard back years and years and years before, because he had a band. Some of you are old enough to remember the Stick People. That was his band, and absolutely no amens there. <laughs> Amen. Some of you are old enough. I'm telling you, you are. <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> nobody plays Killaloo, man. <laughs> so, um, so that that happenstantial meeting. Uh, was not it. It was getting a, uh, an email from him that had that PS. Uh, if you're ever looking for a band, I know this guy. And we had a gig, I had a gig coming up in uh, Aurora. And I just thought, well, how bad can it be? <laughs> it's Aurora, you know, not big expectations. And, and uh, so I said to him, we got this gig, it's nothing, it won't pay anything, nobody will come, it's it's crazy, it can't work, are you in, basically? And, and he said completely, he just said, I'm in, that's all he wrote. And you know, I, I'll never forget, he, he pulled up his car and he started unloading stuff. And then he kept unloading stuff. And I looked at this, I thought, Jesus, it's like Led Zeppelin or something. It's, there's, a, there's a mountain of gear and me on the other side of the stage. And this has got me thinking, yeah, this is why I never wanted to do it because it's just gonna be a f crazy fight or something. And then he stood up there for about two hours and he never faced the audience. He faced the wall, basically, and 
you know, and that. But I knew something was there. And there, I knew something about his, uh, his integrity. And then uh, it, it asked an awful lot of me because basically I'm a one-man show. <laughs> I know that, and uh, that's the way it's had to be most of the time. And uh, to let somebody in and to entrust what I was trying to do to them without a lot of elaboration was and remains a, a, a leap every night. And so we don't talk about what we do. Uh, we don't talk about interviews. for. The, I mean, we talk about doing it, but we don't talk about it. We can talk about the experience of it to some degree, but to begin to veer off in that direction of exercising some kind of sense of mastery or or um, conjuring basically dares the whole operation, you know. And uh, we establish a set list that's as close as we get. And you saw what happens five minutes before you go out, you're still wondering what you're going to do. And, and he's saying, do you want me to play something underneath it? So that's how um, uh, Les Mis it is. You know, we, we, uh, we have to leave an enormous amount of room for what we're not in charge of. And... Uh, there's something in that that more audiences than not seem compelled by. And they, you can see them rise towards it. And they, they, more than just wanting a break from the climate-controlled life that they've become accustomed to, there's something else, you know. There's, there's something that's not housebroken, that... Uh, that they never knew was possible. And I don't know if you can imagine such a thing uh, when the, from the outside it looks like just another event with microphones and guitars and, and is it spoken word? Well, I talk. Well, is it music? Well, there's, it's musical. Oh, so it's theater, well, it's theatrical. Yeah, but it's, it's none of the things you're gonna suggest to me. And I realized finally one day that it's because it's so old what we're doing is, is, a, is an ancient thing because we're trying to get back to the days before there was such a thing as an audience and that division and, and that um, barrier and, and that sense of being off the hook for what's happening where you just get to adjudicate after the fact sort of thing. And, and largely because the, the emotional and cultural context is, um, obviously I don't know what your take on it is, but I think we're in a lot of trouble. And I don't think that's going to reverse itself anytime in anybody's lifetime sitting here tonight. So that lends a degree of seriousness, but not somberness. You know, we take the thing very seriously, and then we can't believe ourselves. And somewhere in there, somebody calls three. One, two, three, go. And before you know it, it's... Uh, welcome friends and the audience used to think I was talking to them but I could never have done that in the in the forest if I was talking to the audience so I'm not I'm trying to ask you know everyone but us if they're willing to help us out for a little while because there's a lot at stake and all our shoulders are very slender now and it's a lot to carry so that's who, who I'm literally invoking you know for friends we may soon be, I say. For, for friends are forged on the dark road. The one that's headed out of town and, and we're headed there. And so it doesn't shock me at all that Ian decided that that was something to isolate and to have as an overture or an invocation for the film as well. Yeah, and I was, I was glad to see it. Yeah. Well, thanks, Steve. Uh, you know, as you're speaking there, it, um, two things came to me. One is... I think there's a vignette in Die Wise where you say, you speak about, uh, I don't know if it was you or you were telling a story about um, one, maybe a nurse, a palliative care nurse speaking to a child, right, who was terminal. I believe that was the story. And how in the, it's such a beautifully crafted um, approach to that moment when the child, in this case, said to the nurse, or you're asking, what would you say if the child says, am I dying? Yeah. And then it's like, well, what do we do now? And then how does it... And her instructions yeah. back at the nursing station is patient not to be informed of diagnosis. That's right. So yeah. what's your job? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And 
that that's coming to me with um, this, you know, the anthemic. I want maybe those of you who haven't seen the show. I mean, I won't give away the finale, but let's just say, like the beginning of the film, where uh, Steve says, you know, there's no wider audience than people that are going to die. That's everybody, <laughs> and that this there's this something happening now. I feel which is such a I don't know if hunger is the right tone of it, but a kind of hunger for those willing to tell the truth about this time. And it's not the same as, you know, the, the climate calamity, you know, we got to change or else, you know, it's not this kind of extremist, but it's also not the, no, we're fine, we'll just, you know, magic our way out of it. It's like there's this tone of, this, and this is, I think, what the hunger is that nobody rarely knows that they actually want to hear is someone willing to actually be truthful about this time and not what what do we do about it you know let's jump to the 10 steps but it's there's something in that and i feel this film as well that's that's the part of what i also tried to convey is this kind of it doesn't mean i don't know the world's over there's nothing to do that there's something else you know let's take a little walk so i don't know i, I wonder if you might speak to that is that the hunger is that the the elder function as well. Yeah. This, to me, again, was the kind of backdrop to this whole thing. Mm. Well, I, as is my want, I'd quibble a little bit with the question and, yeah. and say I'm going to distance myself from the word the truth. Yeah, please. Yeah, because, uh, well, I don't trust it. That's all. And I certainly don't uh, uh, propose to approach it, never mind to hand it out, you know. But I can testify, though. I don't need Thank the you. truth to testify. If I have a good memory that's not compromised about what I wish were so, I can be a faithful witness instead of a passive observer. I can do that. And maybe that's what you're referring to. I, I learned it, you know, sitting beside all those people who were dying. But I found out it was a transferable skill because of a lot of things that are in the throw in the early days of of giving way and uh, you know I had uh, I, knew, I knew a woman a long time ago and her mother was an amazing cook and I kept saying to her would you learn how to cook from your mom which is never a good thing romantically speaking you just <laughs> she probably shouldn't say that you know but, but I said it several times I really meant it at the time but her mother had extraordinary sort of philosophical chops as most people who are good in the kitchen do and, uh, and she once looked up, she said it in Italian, but I, I more or less understood it. She just looked out across the great wide world and the, and the mysterious alchemy of what was under her hands. And she said, you know, food makes hunger. That's all she said and went right back to it. And I'm sitting there like, God, Moses, just, just uh, wait, I got to write that down. And of course, I was confounded by it as many of you sitting here right now might be if you let yourself because if normally our thoughts about hunger are that they're a direct consequence of not eating so when the food is absent the hunger rises but we've just few of us have just been out on a weekend in the country and uh, we many of us didn't eat for quite a while and that appetite actually does this it doesn't rise and the amazing thing is you have no appetite whatsoever and suddenly golden lake chinese comes across your palate and <laughs> You start thinking, I could do that. It's not really a thought, I'll admit. It's more like a dare that you are introducing to yourself. I dare you to think about that one more time. <laughs> Anyhow, poor, poor guys, they're just trying to make it, you know. But um, so if food makes hunger, it might be true outside of the kitchen as well. And there's something about a willingness to not blink that might have the consequence of opening the eyes of others. And I can tell you with no hesitation, and I hope this doesn't disqualify me as being a good, good Canadian, but I don't blink. You're not supposed to say that about yourself in this country, but <laughs> I waited for somebody to say it and it didn't happen, so I'm supplying the PS. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm curious to know, 
you know, you spoke of the initial days of the tour, the, the kind of one-off, you know, noticing there was something there. Uh, I joined on the road, actually, with Stephen and Gregory when it was the two of them, subsequently, through a number of dates, and I recorded, uh, I was invited to just try to gather what I could, and mm -hmm. in a short time, it was maybe two weeks alone, I wasn't able to, to gather enough to really put something together. Uh, and then, again, through this mysterious, you know, Grant and, and all the rest, suddenly I had a crew. Uh, and another thing that happened uh, two days before the Salt Spring show, which that's where I would begin shooting, uh, was my son was born. Mm -hmm. two, <laughs> two days before, yeah. And uh, he actually came to the concert. So <laughs> side stage, you know, headphones and all, but I think uh, he's a fan, but. <laughs> Uh, and and now, of course, it's gone, you know, I mean, gl literally global, but it's uh, it's been to, I don't know how many countries now, but quite a few. Quite and, a few, yeah. yeah. And, and it has this mysterious rolling, you know, momentum mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I wonder how has it changed for you now as the show has begun to gather, mm -hmm. you know, more, I mean, the drummer and then the, you know, Lisa on keyboard, and then I think there's another. Bass. The bass. Player, or, yeah. Yeah, and how has that? Um, yeah, how has that been for you as it's continued to? Yeah, it's become massively more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> no, you've no idea what it costs to keep five people plus sound, and roadie and so on, on the road uh, for uh, any length of time at all, because they're getting paid whether they're playing or not. You see, so then who doesn't get paid or who gets paid last? And the answer is the financier of the whole operation. And who would that be? I'm so fabulously successful as a result of DieWise, of course. That, <laughs> so yeah, literally I'm funding the whole thing up front. And so there's that. And the Protestant in me is screaming bloody murder <laughs> all the time about it. Do you have any idea? And then the, uh, it, I know you're curious in a purient sort of way, how much is this costing? So I can tell you this, the tour that is going to begin in a few weeks is up around $270,000 up front. Oh. Uh, that's crazy, isn't it? Yes, it is. So we're trying to crowdfund it. We're starting tonight, I think, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> so it didn't cost you much to get in, but to get out, <laughs> it's going to be quite the, a bit. The heat's been rising, I've been feeling. That's right. That's right. It's going to be a kind of a Bikram thing in here in <laughs> no time. So, uh, well, how's it changed? I think um, certainly we're not holding our breath you know, wondering what comes next, what he's going to do, vice versa, you know? We started with the two of us in, uh, aside from Aurora, I think in New York City. That was literally the second gig we did, which that's just crackers, you know? A sold-out house in New York City. And, uh, and then we did uh, Austin, I think, Texas, and Berkeley, California, and uh, Boulder, yeah. And, and that's how this thing kind of lurched up out of the ooze and found itself in, in front of sold out houses doing something we literally had never done and had literally no preparation in except our lives. You know, how long did it take you to write that song? My whole life, if you want to know the truth. And, um, and he said to me one time, Gregory did, he said, you know, when I was uh, early on the stage, uh, there was an old guy who was a sound guy and he could see I was nervous one night so he took me aside, he said, listen, man, it's easy. This is all it comes down to. Trust the song. Not the audience, not the venue, not the sound, not yourself, not your memory, but who got you here? And it's the song that got you here. So he was saying that about the stories, you see. And um, well, I, I, uh, I grew to... Uh, love Gregory Hoskins. That's what happened. And um, he thinks I'm okay too, <laughs> apparently. So then he brought his girlfriend into the actors. I don't know if they're married or not. And then his girlfriend's sister, you know, it could become nepotism, right? <laughs> and now we have a new drummer and, um, and for some of the local shows, uh, we have a choir as well. So we have eight or nine people on the stage. So it is kind of Les Mis now that I think about it. <laughs> And, um, 
you know, for all of that, does it feel unwieldy or does it feel like it's overgrown itself or not at all? It feels like it's approximating what it always knew it could be. And it's, it's growing a kind of, uh, it's limber now in its muscles. And I'm extremely proud of it. And uh, it's why we haven't called ourselves anything. There's no name for the act. The only name we've given is to the event, you see, and because that's what we're trying to draw the focus to. It's not who's on the stage or what they're doing or any of that. It's, it's what might yet be on that dark road, you know. By the way, at Lost Nation Road, you're familiar with where we got the title from. It's just wherever, yeah, out this way, right, up in the hills. I saw that sign one time and I thought, man, I got to remember that. Lost Nation Road pretty much says it all. It's just, a, I don't know, half an hour away from here. So, um, mostly what it's become is it's taken all my concerns and handed them back to me and said, you won't be needing these anymore. Maybe one last thing too on the Lost, though, because that, yeah. it is a... I mean, it, it zips right by in the film as well, and I did, there was a, a lot that I wanted to spend on it, and the limit of the film, actually, based on the grant, was 20 minutes. I pushed him a little. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is such a, such a key uh, aspect is, uh, I mean, you say lost is uh, not, you don't know where you are, it's you wish you weren't here. Yeah. And in the context of the film, uh, you know, I draw the parallel between um, this, the, the culture that's death phobic in that those that um, maybe don't want to be where they are, or a culture that doesn't want to be where it is, that doesn't know where it is, the rate of change, the, you know, the, I mean, as soon as you get to the headlines, the biospheric destruction and all the rest. Yeah. So this loss, and then there's the loss too of, of so what, what befalls a people whereby they uh, are a lost nation? You know, like it, an elaboration on that, I think is, I would love to hear that, you know, there's a whole book, Come of Age, actually, which talks a lot about, about this, but how um, even coming to understand what lostness is from that perspective uh, is itself a kind of, I don't know, detonating, yeah. you know? And anyway, I guess I would, I would be remiss not to just be able to ask a little bit more about that in the context of this before we turn it over to the audience. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sure, I'll try. Well, you know, it's, it's unwise to take counsel from lost people about the nature of lostness. You can observe them in the act of being lost, but you're not going to rely on their testimony as being an accurate rendering of that condition, you see. Because, lo like I tried to suggest very quickly in the film, you could reimagine lost as having nothing to do with your location. Nothing to do with what the map says or doesn't say or its failure to Google you into some sense of security. You could rather say that if your security depends on a map, it will never occur. You see? Yeah. Because you're relying on a map to get you out of where you are. Not really to tell you where you are, but to get you through it onto the place that you insist upon. And one of the cardinal points on the compass of lost people is hope. I mean, if you just entertain the distinct possibility that people who are full of hope are by definition not fans of the present. I mean, that's, that's where hope leads you. Hope's all about the future. And that's what it obliges you to. And hopeful people are very clear that the, that the present is not good enough. Or it's not going to last in whatever it is. Right? And of course, there's another thing I learned in the death trade all those years ago, is everyone who's copying a hopeful plea was spending all of their dying time hoping they weren't dying so that they could have more time with the kids. And even though they were in the more time with the kids' time, they never occupied it that way because they were hoping it wasn't so. And on and on, it's, it's madness when you begin to articulate it. You know, it's madness. So the antidote to hope is the willingness to find a way to inhabit and, and deeply occupy where you are. Not exercise your uh, inexhaustible uh, capacity to wish you weren't. Right? 
So, so that's the plea of, of the, uh, that phrasing. When I said, you know, America, I don't mean the United States of, I mean the whole psychic mythic operation called America. That's a European fantasy. And it was crafted by people who couldn't wait to get away from everything they'd ever known. And this is not a, a firm foundation for anything. You know, people in flight masquerading as looking for something. They were just trying to get out, you know, and it, there's no sign that it's not still true. Still trying to get out. And this allegation of a dream that has the word America attached to it, that's not what it is. It's a refusal to be awake. It's not a dream. You know? It's like a wretched kind of psychic ancestral hangover that you can't find the hair of the dog to soothe yourself about it. So, yeah, I mean, we, you know, our, obviously our way of life in North America has a lot to answer for. And it's not even beginning to do so. And the, the idea that we could voluntarily desist or at least slow the hell down shows no sign of any real purchase in, you know, across the culture, right? And I don't know how that's ever, anybody's going to be able to look at young people and explain that or defend it, or even make it make sense, right? But I think ancestrally, it savagely makes more sense than we wish it did. Because when we got to the West Coast, this had, did not exhaust our, fl our flight. And at some level, we're still, still fleeing, right? Even the back to the land thing, flight. A refusal to be. Uh, get to work where you are, man. <laughs> you know, the land doesn't need another person on it. I mean, this is, runs absolutely counter to most people who live around here for me to say such a thing. But um, we increase the number of building permits and the number of street lights and the reason that you came here will not even be here in 30 years. You know? Because people are trying to get out. But what are they bringing with them? The expectation of the country plus street lights. You know what I'm saying. And all of that. Yeah. So, uh, so don't listen to lost people about what it is to be lost, but by all means learn from them until you recognize yourself in their number, and that's when yikes time is. Ah, of course. How do, I, how do I wish otherwise? And the answer is, you don't. You don't change your wishes first and then your life alters accordingly. You change your behavior. And kicking and screaming, the rest of you more or less follows belligerently like your kid in the bulk food section of the store. You say, but I want it. And so. It's easily done, but you do have to hear, hear some snarling for a while from your baser self. No? <laughs> Thank you for that image. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd love to turn it over to you and also maybe to kick the air back in. That might be helpful. I don't know. Up here is getting really toasty. There's maybe an origin. Ah, so the question is, when did the fear of death become a big friggin' deal? Well, you know, the beginning of anything is recognizable in hindsight. It's never recognizable at the time. Like, for example, the beginning of your aging process. <laughs> you, you have to find out about that, that it's in fact already begun. The best way to do that is go to the alternative health food store and, <laughs> and roam around in the vitamin section and recognize that two-thirds of the vitamins are intended for your infirmities. And then it starts to click in. Whoa, I'm of the demographic that draws this much attention pharmaceutically, for example. So you have that to look forward to. Um, so I don't know that the fear of dying is ever recognizable as the fear of dying when it's on you. Especially in a culture like this one, which is so fantasy-driven and so um, personal initiative drunk you know, and personal rights and privileges drunk and all of that kind of thing. So um, when people exercise their right, oh, well, let's just jump off the bridge here and talk about euthanasia for a second. Um, so euthanasia is all but legal, I think, in most of the country now. When I was working in the trade, it was deeply illegal and very much feared and then subtly and passively practiced nonetheless. I can tell you I was in on a good number of those things before anybody would admit that such a thing was, was going on routinely. So I would simply investigate the thing, not in terms of pro or con,
but suggest to you that the legalization of euthanasia is a consequence of this death phobia, not a solution to it, a child of it instead. And the basic mechanics, I think, are quite naked once you're willing to consider them. Uh, it goes like this. So why do we need euthanasia? Well, because dying is hell. And uh, you've got to be able to end hell because it's indefensible, right? What makes dying hell? Well, all the suffering. But I can tell you, and, and my days in the trade are now dated. So it's only better than it was in what I'm about to tell you. In those days, virtually every dying person came to their dying time with a, an absolutely wretched anxiety about what was to become of their bodies. That's where all their terror landed. You know, the physical pain, the physical suffering, the writhing at 3 a.m. in agony and all of that thing. And I'm here to tell you that that virtually never happened. Occasionally, but those were very much the exceptions because the skillfulness of the medical crew was such that they had recourse to a lot of um, let's, pharmaceutical measures that made sure it never got anywhere close to that. Now, there's a downside to that, but it's a trade-off. And here's the point, that the, the worst fear never came to pass, and increasingly people resorted to uh, sedation in particular, and demanded it in the last week or two of their life, and were routinely prescribed it. So, there's a mystery. If your worst fear upon dying never comes to pass, from whence comes this demand? to be sedated, since you're clearly fear, uh, free of the fear that you nursed for so long? And the, my answer is that people were wrong about what they feared most. And what they really feared most was the distinct possibility of disappearing without a trace and, and becoming a rumor rather than a presence. That was the big one, and no one ever said it the way I just said it to you now, because it was basically unrecognized and for the most part, unrecognizable. And that's what led to the demand for a sedation, even though the pain was well managed. You see, because the sedation was the treatment for that deep existential, uh, uh, almost unbearable anxiety about disappearing without a trace. And euthanasia is an exercise in personal dominion, of personal control, as if controlling your outcome and deciding when solves the problem of not wanting to die anyway. So I'm just suggesting to you that when, when uh, generations in this country live their entire lives in the presence of the legalized euthanasia, such that they never knew that it wasn't there, you will find that the death phobia that's fundamental to the culture will be not only intact, it will be enhanced by virtue of this measure. Because the challenge about whether dying is something that breeds this inevitably in you will never rise. It's already bought and sold in the euthanasia movement. The agreement is already that death should not be born if there's a plan B. And euthanasia is the plan B. So it's beyond whether we approve or disapprove or agree or not. The dynamics, the mechanics of the thing leave the... the deep dread of dying intact and not even challenged and not even spoken about and that's too bad so when did this start oh i think a, a lot of it has to do with uh, you know we're the spawn of uh, spontaneous mass migration that wasn't planned wasn't intended and uh, the consequences for the uh, indigenous people are certainly something for them to talk about but the consequences of us fleeing as we've done and leaving everything behind that answered the question, what is to become of me after I die, is with us still. And he's funny, though. <laughs> uh, Steve, I recall, you know, in the show, again, that the the beginning is this invocation, is this, um, like the film, it harkens back to this kind of um, naming of this, hey, well, you're going to die. Yeah. And in the journey of the, f uh, the show, Nights of Grief and Mystery, that it, 
it takes on an, an anthemic quality. Mm -hmm. And then I was struck actually by the the parallel between what you were saying, you know, in Die Wise at the time, and then what was you were still saying, but now within a very different, you know, I mean, it was a kind of a, I mean, on Salt Spring, it was people on their feet, they were, you know, jumping up and down, and it was this deep. Tell, tell the people what they were dancing to. What was I saying? You'll be dead soon. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all, everybody's rocking. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm getting amens like you can't believe. Yeah. Like, I just knocked myself out on the last answer. Not a sound. Yeah. But every show that we close with a particular story when we've done it, it's not every show, but yeah. uh, the people are absolutely on their feet like it's a tent show revival. <laughs> it's astounding. And what's the refrain of the entire story? You'll be dead soon. Yeah. <laughs> and somehow it's a, it's a reason to rise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you. This, I mean, this film is probably the sixth, <laughs> maybe short, that has come out over the years is I feel for myself um, as a filmmaker and also, you know, in school that I've been tracking a kind of trail. And in some ways, there's short films, as many of you may have seen, The Meaning of Death, The Making of Humans, that these have been in a way for me almost a, uh, yeah, like a trail through this uh, forest of, of trying to make sense of um, I mean, not just my own journey, but, you know, as I see what's happening in the culture. And so Lost Nation Road itself is also a next elaboration, you know, um, attempting to be faithful to that uh, same trail. And, um, you know, over it all, that I have been on this, I don't know, six years, seven years now, that there has been this thought of the, what's the quote, big one, <laughs> which doesn't really have a name, but, uh, but still feels a bit like, I don't know what it is, maybe, um, you know, the sand in a sand dune, you know, digging out, um, hitting, hitting your toe on something in the sand dune and realizing, you know, it's a little something and you kind of brush it off and you realize, oh, it's a completely buried city. That's a bit like what it's felt like with this mm -hmm. has been to try to, to approach that in a way that is faithful to that. And well, it still hasn't emerged. And so I can say, from the Lost Nation Road, certainly, yes, we had a lot of um, elements that didn't make it into this particular short. We are releasing them online as well as we go, uh, particularly like a short with Lisa, who's the keyboardist, and um, other elements. Um, Stephen talking about Brother Blue, uh, incredible story, which that'll be released online as well as like companion pieces. And I will say that, I mean, I am still in that gathering and listening for like, what is that mysterious something still buried beneath the sand. Hmm. Yeah. And I'm still here, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's taken up the dare <laughs> to stick around. Yeah. Well, obviously, we're, we're uh, coming to the end of the evening since um, there's not much to respond to. Oh, yeah. Yes, one last question. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Gregory and I are mounting a about a 25 or so city tour uh, in Canada and the US, starting in about three weeks, thereabouts. And it's starting pretty, well, I think Kitchener and, what's the first couple, James? Kitchener on the 12th of September, uh, Kingston on Monday, September 16th, Renfrew on, uh, on the 17th, and Montreal on the 18th. So that's, that's us um, getting everything up and, and rolling, and then uh, out west, and then down south, and so on. And um, but I tell you, I don't know what one, what gets one into this kind of rare company, where you live long enough, where something you wrote ten or twelve years ago suddenly appears before you, almost unrecognizable. In, as a song that two women are singing. And as I heard it the first, that's only the second time I've heard it. And I thought to myself, ah, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. I just find it, I, I mean, I'm just bowled over. I mean, over, over and above the artistic quality of that composition, it's entirely theirs. The sound and the pacing and all of that and their, their reading of what I tried to come across 
with that little poem that ended the or prayer that ended the first little book I wrote, or the second. And uh, but from from where I sit, the privilege is. Um, you know, you could easily feel it to be unearned. Like I, like I haven't been around long enough to warrant that kind of treatment. But apparently, I don't understand how it works. <laughs> because there it is, despite my worthiness. And, well, then you have to grow towards it, no? And then you have to earn the worthiness that you're utterly convinced they've misapprehended in you. And somewhere in there you meet and... Uh, so I'm lucky enough to know them. Yeah, it's beautiful. And, uh, and the tour is something very similar, that these very skilled musicians are willing to attach their discipline and their you know, road chops and, and all of that stuff uh, to what I'm trying to do. And just asking me for the chance to do it. And you know, every night, I could, you know, one little backroom story I can tell you. Every night before we go out, Every one of them has come up to me and just said, thank you. And, and Gregory, who's, who's the front man in his life and his professional life and has been, you know, for 30 years, he said something in my presence that still bowls me over. He said, uh, he said, oh, he said, I know my place in this. That was astounding that he's willing to stand there and you know, guide the music and, and all of that and, um, and grants me that, thinking that he's taking a step back. But he's actually, you know, granting me something. That, so all of these things are a remarkable recipe for a, a sense of well-being that is, is unnerving almost. And any of you have been out on the road touring, and so you know it's a kind of, it's an artificial life in some ways, but yet somehow the way we've done it and, 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 and the reason that we're out there and the thing we get to remember every night sees to it that um, those two and a half hours with the people, that's everything we come towards and that's everything we remember on the other side of it. And the entire wave of the day goes to that. And you know, our, our compatriot, Leonard Cohen, bless his bones, years ago he said, you know, the truth of the matter is they do not pay you to sing, no matter what they think, because you'd probably do that for almost nothing. But they do have to pay you to travel, though, because that shit's awful. <laughs> and I do understand what he meant now, to the point now where we've decided we are not going to fly. We're just going to drive. Because the... I'm, I, I'm not going to be in their world anymore. I've done it enough, and I don't believe in the whole insecurity operation. And so we're not going to submit ourselves to it. So, so we're doing it the old-fashioned way, you know, one mile at a time. Yeah. yeah. And um, Gregory really wants to get a horse-drawn, like, gypsy wagon. <laughs> That's what he wants to do. And at least he said, can we do the Renfrew gig by leaving your farm in gypsy wagons? that are hauled by mules and stuff. And I say, it's not in the budget, man. <laughs> so we have to go to Alamo for, or whatever it is. But um, maybe someday, if we get really successful enough, we'll do it by horse-covered horse wagon instead. <laughs> I'd love to roll into town that way. Yeah. Anyway, we are coming to Renfrew, and um, if anything you've heard or seen, it sounds compelling. I should tell you that these, are, these events are the direct consequence of people who've come to something I've done or have come to the school, and they've decided to write a love letter to their town called Pulling This Together and Making It Happen. Nobody's making any money, and everyone feels rich mysteriously. And I can't begin to find a way to to operationalize the gratitude to these people, except to do the absolute best thing we're capable of doing every night. And uh, it might sound like a showbiz um, kind of uh, stale thing, but um, when that's all you have, you don't even blink. And, 
and we're pretty good now. And uh, for the first time since I've done this, we're going to do something that's fairly close to here. Uh, so if you could help the local people put butts in the seats, as they say in the business, you would go very deeply towards rewarding some of your neighbors who you may not know who've decided that this corner of the province and the world might not be poorly served by the show rolling in town. And, and the last thing I'd say to you for, for this evening, at least from me, and then I'll turn it over to Ian since it's his, his film. I've, been, I've subjected myself to the process of being documented a couple of times. And uh, it's a very iffy encounter. And um, every time I've been provisionally disappointed, largely because I don't recognize myself, or that's what I say, I don't recognize myself or my ilk or whatever it is. And then a year or two later, I realized that's not what it is at all. It's just, it's not the emphasis that you'd place on it, I realized to myself. And then it finally hit me with Grief Walker, you know, it's absolutely proper that you have an opportunity to hear what you mean without you having any voice in the meaning that's assigned to what you tried to do. Because that's actually where the meaning of your life comes from. It doesn't come from your authority, no matter what. It comes from the willingness of others to lend some credence, some, some reliability, some longing, whatever it is, to your little enterprise. And uh, I learned a valuable lesson with Grief Walker years ago that the NFB di did. And it allowed me to be, have a degree of nobility in my response that was, had escaped me until then. And then I, I watch Lost Nation Road and I don't have to set anything aside. And I say, Ian McKenzie is faithfully translating from an older guy something that he's hearing for his generation in a way that I could never do it. And I'm enormously grateful to him for doing that.